Book three, chapter eight of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume One, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eight Disputation at Frankfurt, Tetzel's Theses, Menaces, Opposition of Nipstro, Luther's Theses Burnt, The Monks, Luther's Peace, Tetzel's Theses Burnt, Luther's Vexation. The minds of men had thus gradually recovered from their first alarm. Luther himself was disposed to declare that his words did not mean so much as had been imagined. New circumstances might divert public attention, and the blow struck at Roman doctrine might, as had been the case with so many others, spend itself in the air. The partisans of Rome prevented this result. They fanned the flame instead of smothering it. Tetzel and the Dominicans replied haughtily to the attack which had been made upon them. Burning with eagerness to crush the audacious monk who had disturbed their traffic, and to gain the favour of the Roman pontiff, they uttered cries of rage. They maintained that to attack the indulgence ordered by the Pope was to attack the Pope himself, and they called in the aid of all the monks and theologians of their school. In fact, Tetzel felt that an opponent like Luther was too much for him single-handed. Quite disconcerted, but more especially enraged at the doctor's attack, he quitted the environs of Wittenberg and repaired to Frankfurt on the Oder, where he arrived as early as November 1517. The university of that town, like that of Wittenberg, was of recent date. One of the professors was Conrad Wimpina, a man of much eloquence, an old rival of Pollich of Mellerstadt, and one of the most distinguished theologians of the time. Wimpina's envy was excited both by the doctor and by the university of Wittenberg, for their reputation obscured his. Tetzel applied to him for a reply to Luther's theses, and Wimpina wrote two series of antitheses, the former to defend the doctrine of indulgences, and the latter to defend the authority of the Pope. This disputation, which had been long prepared and loudly advertised, and of which Tetzel entertained the highest hopes, took place on the 20th of January, 1518. Tetzel, having beaten up for recruits, Monks had been sent from all the neighbouring cloisters, and assembled to the number of more than three hundred. Tetzel read his theses, one of which declared, that whosoever says that the soul does not fly away from purgatory as soon as the money tinkles on the bottom of the strong-box, is in error. But, above all, he maintained propositions according to which the Pope appeared to be truly, as the Apostle expresses it, seated as God in the temple of God. It was convenient for this shameless merchant to take refuge under the Pope's mantle with all his disorders and scandals. In presence of the numerous assembly in which he stood, he declared himself ready to maintain as follows. Number three. Christians must be taught that the Pope, by the greatness of his power, is above the whole universal church and all councils. His orders ought to be implicitly obeyed. Number four. Christians must be taught that the Pope alone is entitled to decide in matters of Christian faith, that he, and none but he, has the power to explain the meaning of Scripture in his own sense, and to approve or condemn all words or works of others. Number five. Christians must be taught that the judgment of the Pope in things which concern Christian faith, and which are necessary to the salvation of the human race, cannot possibly err. Number six. Christians must be taught that, in matters of faith, they ought to lean and rest more upon the opinion of the Pope, as manifested by his decisions, than on the opinion of all wise men, as drawn by them out of Scripture. Number 8. Christians must be taught that those who attack the honour and dignity of the Pope are guilty of the crime of Lair's Majesty, and deserve malediction. Number 17. 
Christians must be taught that there are many things which the Church regards as authentic articles of universal truth, although they are not found either in the canon of Scripture or in ancient doctors. Number 44. Christians must be taught to regard those as obstinate heretics who, by their words, their actions, or their writings, declare that they would not retract their heretical propositions were excommunication after excommunication to rain or hail upon them. Number 48. Christians must be taught that those who protect heretics in their error, and who, by their authority, prevent them from being brought before the judge who is entitled to try them, are excommunicated, that if, in the space of a year, they desist not from doing so, they will be declared infamous and severely punished with various punishments in terms of law and to the terror of all men. Number 50. Christians must be told that those who spoil so many books and so much paper, and who preach or dispute publicly and wickedly on the confession of the mouth, the satisfaction of works, the rich and great indulgences of the Bishop of Rome, and on his power, that those who ally themselves with those so preaching or writing, who take pleasure in their writings and circulate them among the people and in the world, that those, in fine, who secretly speak of those things in a contemptuous and irreverent manner, may well tremble at incurring the pains which have just been named, and of precipitating themselves and others with them at the last day into eternal condemnation, and even here below into great disgrace. For every beast that toucheth the mountain shall be stoned." We see that Luther was not the only person whom Tetzel attacked. In the 48th thesis he had probably the Elector of Saxony in view. These propositions savour much of the Dominican. To threaten every contradictor with severe punishment was an inquisitor's argument, and scarcely admitted of a reply. The three hundred monks whom Tetzel had brought together gaped and stared in admiration of his discourse. The theologians of the university were too much afraid of being classed with the abettors of heresy, or were too much attached to the principles of Vimpina, candidly to adopt the extraordinary theses which had just been read. The whole affair, about which so much noise had been made, seemed destined to be only a sham fight, but among the crowd of students present at the disputation was a young man of about twenty named John Nipstro. He had read the theses of Luther, and found them conformable to the doctrines of Scripture. Indignant at seeing the truth publicly trampled underfoot, while no one appeared to defend it, this young man rose up to the great astonishment of the whole assembly, and attacked the presumptuous Tetzel. The poor Dominican, who had not counted on such opposition, was quite disconcerted. After some efforts he quitted the field of battle, and gave place to Vimpina, who made a more vigorous resistance. But Nipstro pressed him so closely that, to put an end to a contest, which in his eyes was so unbecoming, Vimpina, who presided, declared the discussion closed, and proceeded forthwith to confer the degree of doctor on Tetzel, in recompense of this glorious combat. Vimpina, to disencumber himself of the young orator, caused him to be sent to the convent of pirates in Pomerania, with orders that he should be strictly watched. But this dawning light was only removed from the banks of the Oder that it might afterwards shed a bright effulgence in Pomerania. When God sees it meet, he employs scholars to confound teachers. Tetzel, wishing to repair the check which he had received, had recourse to the ultima ratio of Rome and the Inquisitors, I mean the faggot. On a public walk in one of the suburbs of Frankfurt, he caused a pulpit and a scaffold to be erected, and repaired thither in solemn procession with his insignia of inquisitor. Mounting the pulpit, he let loose all his fury. He darted his thunder, and with his stentorian voice exclaimed that the heretic Luther ought to be burned alive. Then, placing the doctor's theses and sermon on the scaffold, he burned them. He was better acquainted with this kind of work than with the defence of theses. 
Here he met with no opponents, and his victory was complete. The impudent Dominican returned in triumph to Frankfurt. When parties in power are vanquished, they have recourse to certain demonstrations which must be conceded to them as a kind of consolation to their disgrace. The second theses of Tetzel form an important epoch in the Reformation. They changed the locality of the dispute, transporting it from the indulgence market to the halls of the Vatican, and diverting it from Tetzel to the Pope. Instead of the contemptible creature whom Luther had taken in his fist, they substituted the sacred person of the head of the church. Luther was stunned at this. It is probable that he would himself have taken the step at a later period, but his enemies spared him the trouble. Thenceforward the question related not merely to a disreputable traffic, but to Rome, and the blow by which a bold hand had tried to demolish the shop of Tetzel shook the very foundations of the pontifical throne. Tetzel's theses were only a signal to the Roman troops. A cry against Luther arose among the monks who were infuriated at the appearance of an adversary more formidable than either Erasmus or Reuchlin had been. The name of Luther resounded from the pulpits of the Dominicans, who addressed themselves to the passions of the people, and inveighed against the courageous doctor as a madman, a deceiver, and a demoniac. His doctrine was denounced as the most dreadful heresy. Wait only for a fortnight, or four weeks at farthest, said they, and this noted heretic will be burned. Had it depended only on the Dominicans, the fate of the Saxon doctor had soon been that of Huss and Jerome, but his life was destined to accomplish what the ashes of Huss had begun. Each does the work of God, one by his death and another by his life. Several now began to cry out that the whole University of Wittenberg was tainted with heresy, and pronounced it infamous. "'Let us pursue the villain and all his partisans,' continued they. In several places these exclamations had the effect of stirring up the passions of the people. Those who shared the opinions of the reformer had the public attention directed towards them, and in every place where the monks were strongest the friends of the gospel felt the effects of their hatred. Thus, in regard to the Reformation, the Saviour's prediction began to be accomplished. They will revile you, and persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake. This is a recompense which the world at no time fails to bestow on the decided friends of the gospel. When Luther was made acquainted with Tetzel's theses, and with the general attack of which they were the signal, his courage rose. He felt that it was necessary to withstand such adversaries to the face, and his intrepid zeal had no difficulty in resolving so to do. At the same time their feebleness made him aware of his own strength, and told him what he was. He did not, however, allow himself to give way to those emotions of pride which are so natural to the heart of man. It gives me more difficulty, he writes to Spalatin, to refrain from despising my adversaries, and so sinning against Jesus Christ, than it would give me to vanquish them. They are so ignorant in things human and divine, that one is ashamed at having to fight with them, and yet it is their very ignorance which gives them their inconceivable audacity and face of brass. But the most powerful support to Luther's heart in the midst of this universal opposition was the deep conviction that his cause was the cause of truth. Let it not surprise you, he writes to Spalatin at the beginning of the year 1518, that I am so much insulted. I am delighted with these insults. Did they not curse me, I could not believe so firmly that the cause which I have undertaken is God's own cause. Christ has been set up for a sign to be spoken against. I know, added he, that from the beginning of the world the nature of the word of God has been such that every one who has preached it to the world has been obliged, like the apostles, to leave all and lay his account with death. Were it otherwise, it would not be the word of Jesus Christ. This peace in the midst of agitation is a thing unknown to the world's heroes. 
men placed at the head of a government or of a political party are seen to give way under their labours and their vexations the christian in his struggles usually acquires new strength because he has access to a mysterious source of repose and courage unknown to those whose eyes are closed to the gospel one thing however sometimes distressed luther viz the thought of the dissensions which his courageous opposition might produce he knew that a single word might be sufficient to set the world in a flame and when he foresaw prince against prince and perhaps nation against nation his patriotic heart was saddened and his christian charity alarmed his wish was for peace but he behoved to speak out so god required i tremble said he i shudder at the thought of being the cause of discord among such mighty princes he still kept silence in regard to tetzel's propositions concerning the pope had he been carried away by passion he would doubtless have made an impetuous assault on the extraordinary doctrine under which his opponents sought to take shelter he did not do so and there is in this delay reserve and silence something grave and solemn which sufficiently explains the spirit by which he was animated he waited but not through weakness for when he struck he gave a heavier blow tetzel after his auto da fe at frankfurt on the oder had hastened to send his theses into saxony there thought he they will serve as an antidote to those of luther a man from halle employed by the inquisitor to circulate his propositions arrived at wittemberg the students of the university still indignant at tetzel for having burned the theses of their master no sooner heard of the messenger's arrival than they sought him out and gathering round jostled and frightened him how dare you bring such things here demanded they some purchasing part of the copies with which he was provided and others seizing the rest they got possession of his whole stock amounting to eight hundred copies then unknown to the elector the senate the rector luther and all the other professors they put up the following notice on the boards of the university whosoever is desirous to be present at the burning and funeral of tetzel's theses let him repair at two o'clock to the market-place crowds assembled at the hour and committed the propositions of the dominican to the flames amid loud acclamations one copy which escaped luther afterwards sent to his friend langer of erfurt these generous but imprudent youths followed the old precept eye for eye and tooth for tooth and not that of jesus christ but after the example which doctors and professors had given at frankfurt can we be astonished that young students followed it at wittemberg the news of this academical execution spread throughout germany and made a great noise luther was extremely vexed at it i am astonished he writes to his old master jodocus at erfurt how you could think it was i that burned tetzel's theses do you think that i am so devoid of sense but what can i do when i am the subject of remark everything seems to be believed can i tie up the tongues of the whole world very well let them say let them hear let them see let them pretend whatever they please i will act as long as the lord gives me strength and with his help will fear nothing what will come out of this he says to langer i know not unless it be that my danger is much increased the act of the students shows how much their hearts already burned for the cause which luther defended this was an important symptom for a movement among the young of necessity soon extends to the whole nation the theses of tetzel and vimpina though little esteemed produced a certain effect they heightened the dispute widened the rent which had been made in the mantle of the church and brought questions of the highest interest into the field accordingly the heads of the church began to look more narrowly at the matter and to declare decidedly against the reformer verily i know not in whom luther confides said the bishop of brandenburg when he dares thus attack the power of bishops 
perceiving that this new circumstance called for new proceedings the bishop came in person to wittemberg but he found luther animated with the inward joy which a good conscience imparts and determined to give battle the bishop felt that the augustin monk was obeying an authority superior to his and returned to brandenburg in a rage one day in the winter of fifteen hundred and eighteen when sitting at his fireside he turned to those who were about him and said i will not lay down my head in peace till i have thrown martin into the fire as i do this brand throwing one into the grate the revolution of the sixteenth century was not to be accomplished by the heads of the church any more than that of the first century had been by the sanhedrin and the synagogue in the sixteenth century the heads of the church were opposed to luther the reformation and its ministers in the same way as they were opposed to jesus christ the gospel and his apostles and as they too often are at all times to the truth the bishops says luther in speaking of the visit which the bishop of brandenburg had paid him begin to perceive that they ought to have done what i am doing and they are consequently ashamed they call me proud and audacious and i deny not that i am so but they are not the people to know either what god is or what we are end of book three chapter eight book three chapter nine of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine prierio his dialogue luther's reply hochstraten eck the obelisks the asterisks a more serious resistance than that of tetzel was already opposed to luther rome had answered a reply had issued from the walls of the sacred palace it was not leo x who had taken it into his head to speak theology a quarrel of monks he had one day said the best thing is not to meddle with it and on another occasion it is a drunken german who has written these theses when he recovers from his wine he will speak differently a dominican of rome sylvester mazzolini de prierio or prierias master of the sacred palace exercised the functions of censor and in this character was the first man in italy who knew of the saxon monk's theses a roman censor and the theses of luther what a rencounter liberty of speech liberty of investigation liberty of faith come into collision in rome with that power which pretends to have in its hands a monopoly of intelligence and to open and shut the mouth of christendom at its pleasure the struggle between christian liberty which begets children of god and pontifical despotism which begets slaves of rome is as it were personified during the first days of the reformation in the encounter between luther and prierio the roman censor prior general of the dominicans employed to determine what christendom must say or not say and know or not know hastened to reply and published a tract which he dedicated to leo x he spoke contemptuously of the german monk and declared with a self-sufficiency altogether roman that he was anxious to know whether this martin had a nose of iron or a head of brass which could not be broken then in the form of a dialogue he attacked the theses of luther employing alternately ridicule insult and threatening the combat between the augustin of wittemberg and the dominican of rome took place on the very question which lies at the foundation of the reformation viz what is the sole infallible authority to christians the following is the system of the church as expounded by its most independent organs the letter of the written word is dead without the spirit of interpretation which alone unfolds its hidden meaning now this spirit is not granted to every christian but to the church in other words to the priests it is a great presumption to maintain that he who promised to be with his church always to the end of the world could abandon it to the power of error 
it will be said perhaps that the doctrine and constitution of the church are not the same as we find them in the sacred oracles this is true but the change is only apparent relating to the form and not to the substance moreover the change is an advance the living power of the spirit has given reality to what exists in scripture only in idea it has embodied the sketches of the word put a finishing hand to these sketches and completed the work of which the bible had furnished only the first outlines scripture ought therefore to be understood in the sense determined by the church under the guidance of the holy spirit here the catholic doctors are divided general councils say some and gerson among the number are the representatives of the church the pope says others is the depository of the spirit of interpretation and no man is entitled to understand scripture in a sense differing from that of the roman pontiff this was the opinion of prierio such was the doctrine which the master of the sacred palace opposed to the rising reformation on the power of the pope and the church he advanced propositions at which the most shameless flatterers of the court of rome would have blushed the following is one of the points which he maintains at the commencement of his tract whoever rests not in the doctrine of the roman church and the roman pontiff as the infallible rule of faith from which the holy scripture itself derives its force and authority is a heretic then in a dialogue in which luther and sylvester are the speakers the latter tries to refute the doctor's propositions the sentiments of the saxon monk were quite new to a roman censor accordingly prierio shows that he understood neither the emotions of his heart nor the motives of his conduct to the teacher of truth he applied the little standards of the valets of rome dear luther says he were you to receive a bishopric and a plenary indulgence for the repair of your church from our lord the pope you would proceed more gently and would even prose in favour of the indulgence which you are now pleased to blacken the italian so proud of the elegance of his manners sometimes assumes the most scurrilous tone if the property of dogs is to bite says he to luther i fear your father must have been a dog the dominican begins at last to be almost astonished at his own condescension in speaking to a rebellious monk and concludes with showing his opponent the cruel teeth of an inquisitor the roman church says he having in the pope the summit of spiritual and temporal power may by the secular arm constrain those who after receiving the faith stray from it she is not bound to employ arguments for the purpose of combating and subduing the rebellious these words traced by the pen of one of the dignitaries of the roman court had a very significant meaning they failed however to terrify luther he believed or feigned to believe that this dialogue was not by prierio but by ulrich von hutten or by some other of the authors of the letters of some obscure men who said he in his sarcastic strain had in order to stir up luther against prierio compiled this mass of absurdity he had no desire to see the court of rome in arms against him however after remaining for some time silent his doubts if he had any having been dispelled he set to work and in two days after was prepared with his reply the bible had produced the reformer and begun the reformation luther in believing had no need of the testimony of the church his faith was derived from the bible itself from within and not from without his thorough conviction that the evangelical doctrine was immovably founded on the word of god made him regard all external authority as useless luther's experience in this respect opened a new prospect to the church the living spring which had burst forth before the monk of wittemberg was destined to become a stream at which nations would quench their thirst the church had said that in order to understand the word the spirit of god must interpret it and so far the church was right but her error consisted in regarding the holy spirit as a monopoly conferred on a certain caste and in thinking that it could be appropriated exclusively to certain assemblies and colleges to a city or a conclave 
the wind bloweth where it listeth were the words of the son of god when speaking of the spirit of god and on another occasion they will all be taught of god the corruption of the church the ambition of pontiffs the animosities of councils the squabbles of the clergy and the pomp of prelates had made this holy spirit this breath of humility and peace eschew the dwelling of the priesthood he had deserted the assemblies of the proud and the palaces of the princes of the church and gone to live in retirement among simple christians and modest priests he had shunned a domineering hierarchy which often forced blood from the poor whom it trampled under foot he had shunned a proud and ignorant clergy whose chiefs were skilled not in the bible but in the sword and he was found sometimes among despised sects and sometimes among men of talents and learning the holy cloud withdrawing from proud basilisks and gorgeous cathedrals had descended on the obscure dwellings of the humble or on chambers where studious men calmly pursued their conscientious labours the church degraded by her love of power and riches dishonoured in the eyes of the people by the venal use which she made of the doctrine of life the church which sold salvation in order to fill a treasury for luxury and debauchery to empty had lost all respect men of sense no longer set any value on her testimony but despising an authority so degraded turned with joy towards the divine word and its infallible authority as toward the only refuge which remained to them in the general confusion the age therefore was prepared the bold movement by which luther changed the point on which the human heart rested its highest hopes and with a mighty hand transferred those hopes from the walls of the vatican to the rock of the word of god was hailed with enthusiasm this was the work which the reformer had in view in his reply to prierio putting aside the axioms which the dominican had placed at the head of his work he says after your example i too am going to lay down some axioms the first is the saying of st paul should we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you let him be accursed the second is the following passage of st augustine addressed to st jerome i have learned to pay to the canonical books alone the honour of believing very firmly that none of them has erred as to others i believe not what they say for the simple reason that it is they who say it luther then vigorously proceeds to lay down the fundamental principles of the reformation the word of god the whole word of god and nothing but the word of god if you understand these principles continues he you will also understand that your whole dialogue is completely overturned for you have done nothing else than adduce the words and opinions of st thomas next attacking the axioms of his opponent he frankly declares his opinion that popes and councils may err he complains of the flattery of the roman courtiers in attributing to the pope the alleged infallibility of both popes and councils and declares that the church exists virtually only in christ and representatively only in councils coming afterwards to the supposition which prierio had made he says no doubt you judge me by yourself but if i aspired to a bishopric assuredly i would not use language which sounds so hateful in your ears do you imagine i am ignorant how bishops and the popedom are procured at rome do not the very children in the streets sing the well-known words rome nowadays is more unclean than aught that in the world is seen this was among the stanzas current in rome before the election of one of the last popes nevertheless luther speaks of leo with respect i know says he that in him we have as it were a daniel in babylon his integrity has repeatedly endangered his life he concludes with a few words in reply to the menaces of prierio in fine you say that the pope is at once pontiff and emperor and that he has power to constrain by the secular arm are you thirsting for murder take my word for it your rhodomontades and your loud-sounding threats cannot terrify me 
though i be killed christ lives christ my lord and the lord of all blessed for ever and ever amen thus luther with a strong arm assails the infidel altar of the papacy opposing to it the altar of the word of god alone holy alone infallible before which he would have every knee to bow and on which he declares himself ready to sacrifice his life Priario published a reply and after it a third treatise on the irrefragable truth of the church and of the roman pontiff in which founding on ecclesiastical law he says that though the pope were to send the people and himself to the devil en masse he could not for so doing be either judged or deposed the pope was at length obliged to impose silence on Priario. a new opponent soon entered the list he too was a dominican james hochstraten inquisitor at cologne whom we have already seen assailing reuchlin and the friends of letters was furious when he saw luther's boldness it was indeed necessary that darkness and monkish fanaticism should engage in close fight with him who was to give them their death-blow monkism was formed after primitive truth had begun to decay and from that period downward errors and monks had gone hand in hand the man who was to hasten their ruin had appeared but these sturdy champions would not quit the field without a fierce combat this combat they continued to wage with him throughout his whole life though the proper personification of it is in hochstraten hochstraten and luther the one the free and intrepid christian and the other the blustering slave of monkish superstition hochstraten unchains his rage and with loud cries demands the death of the heretic his wish is to secure the triumph of rome by means of the flames it is high treason against the church exclaims he to let so execrable a heretic live another single hour let a scaffold be instantly erected for him this sanguinary counsel was alas but too well followed in many countries the voice of numerous martyrs as in the first days of the church bore testimony to the truth in the midst of the flames but in vain were fire and sword invoked against luther the angel of jehovah constantly encamped around him and shielded him luther replied to hochstraten briefly but very energetically go says he to him when concluding go delirious murderer whose thirst can only be quenched by the blood of the brethren my sincere desire is that you guard against calling me a christian and a believer and that on the contrary you never cease to denounce me as a heretic understand these things well you bloody man you enemy of the truth and if your furious rage impel you to devise mischief against me do it with circumspection and time your measures well god knows what i purpose if he grants me life my hope and expectation god willing will not deceive me hochstraten was silent a more painful attack awaited the reformer dr eck the celebrated professor of ingolstadt who procured the liberty of urban regius luther's friend had received the famous theses eck was not the man to defend the abuses of indulgences but he was a doctor of the school and not of the bible being well versant in scholastics but not in the word of god if prierio had represented rome and hochstraten had represented the monks eck represented the school the school which for about five centuries had ruled christendom far from yielding to the first blows of the reformer proudly rose up to crush the man who dared to assail it with floods of contempt eck and luther the school and the word came to blows on more than one occasion but the present was the occasion on which the combat commenced eck must have regarded several of luther's assertions as erroneous for nothing obliges us to question the sincerity of his convictions he defended the scholastic opinions with enthusiasm just as luther defended the declarations of the word of god we may even suppose that he was somewhat pained at seeing himself obliged to oppose his old friend and yet it would seem from the mode of attack that passion and jealousy had some share in his determination 
he gave the name of obelisks to his remarks on the theses of luther wishing at first to save appearances he did not publish his work but contented himself with communicating it confidentially to his ordinary the bishop of eichstadt soon however whether through the indiscretion of the bishop or of eck himself the obelisks were circulated in all quarters a copy having fallen into the hands of a friend of luther link preacher at nuremberg he lost no time in sending it to the reformer eck was a much more formidable opponent than tetzel prierio and hochstraten his work was the more dangerous the more it surpassed theirs in knowledge and subtlety he affected pity for his feeble opponent knowing well that pity injures more effectively than anger and insinuated that the propositions of luther contained bohemian poison and savoured of bohemia by these malicious insinuations he threw upon luther the obloquy and hatred which in germany attached to the name of huss and the schismatics of his country the malice which shone through this treatise roused luther's indignation while the thought that the blow was given by an old friend was still more distressing however he must sacrifice his affections in defending the truth luther unbosomed his heart and its sadness in a letter to egranus pastor at zwickau i am called in the obelisks a venomous man a bohemian a heretic seditious insolent and presumptuous i say nothing of milder epithets such as sleepy imbecile ignorant contemner of the sovereign pontiff etc this book is full of the grossest insults and yet the author is a distinguished man alike remarkable for learning and talent and it is this that grieves me most a man with whom i had recently contracted a close friendship viz john eck doctor in theology and chancellor of ingolstadt a celebrated and illustrious author did i not know the thoughts of satan i would be astonished at the furious manner in which this man has broken off a friendship at once so pleasant and so recent and this without giving me any warning without writing or saying a single word but if luther's heart be wounded his courage is not destroyed on the contrary he girds himself for the combat rejoice my brother says he to egranus whom a violent enemy had also attacked rejoice and be not alarmed at all these flying leaves the more furious my adversaries become the more i advance i leave the things which are behind that they may bark after them and follow those which are before that they may in like manner bark after them in their turn Eck felt how shameful his conduct had been, and endeavoured to justify it in a letter to Karlstadt, in which he calls Luther their common friend, and throws all the blame on the bishop of Eichstadt, at whose instigation he pretended that he had written the work. His intention, he said, was not to publish the obelisks, but for this he would have had more regard for the friendship subsisting between him and Luther and he requested that luther instead of coming to open rupture with him would turn his arms against the theologians of frankfurt the professor of ingolstadt who had not feared to strike the first blow began to be alarmed at the power of the opponent whom he had imprudently attacked and would willingly have evaded the contest it was too late all these fine words did not persuade luther who was however disposed to be silent and said i will patiently swallow this morsel though fit for cerberus but his friends were of a different opinion and urged or rather constrained him to answer he accordingly replied to the obelisks by his asterisks opposing as he says playing upon the word to the rust and lividity of obelisks the light and dazzling brightness of the stars of heaven in this work he treats his new opponent less harshly than those whom he had previously combated but his indignation is seen peeping through his words he showed that in the chaos of the obelisks there was nothing from the holy scriptures nothing from the fathers of the church and nothing from the ecclesiastical canons 
but they contained only scholastic glosses and opinion after opinion many of them mere dreams in a word contained the very things which luther had attacked the asterisks are full of spirit and life the author's indignation rises at the errors of his friend's book but he shows pity to the man he reiterates the fundamental principle which he had laid down in his reply to prierio the sovereign pontiff is a man and may be led into error but god is truth and cannot be deceived then employing the argumentum ad hominem against the scholastic doctor he says to him it is certainly impudent in any one to teach as the philosophy of aristotle any dogma which cannot be proved by his authority you grant this well then it is a fortiori the most impudent of all things to affirm in the church and among christians anything that jesus christ himself has not taught now in what part of the bible is it said that the treasure of christ's merits is in the hands of the pope he adds as to the malicious charge of bohemian heresy i patiently bear the reproach for the love of jesus christ i live in a celebrated university a distinguished town an important bishopric and a powerful duchy where all are orthodox and where doubtless no toleration would be given to so wicked a heretic luther did not publish the asterisks he only communicated them to his friends it was not till a later period that they were given to the public this rupture between the doctor of ingolstadt and the doctor of wittemberg made a sensation in germany they had common friends Scherl, in particular by whose instrumentality their friendship appears to have been originally formed was exceedingly annoyed he was one of those who longed to see a reform throughout the whole germanic church produced through the medium of its most distinguished organs but if in matters of principle the most eminent theologians of the period came to open rupture and while luther advanced in a new path eck put himself at the head of those who kept to the old path what disruption must inevitably ensue would not numerous adherents gather around each of the two chiefs and form two hostile camps in the heart of the empire Scherl exerted himself to reconcile eck and luther the latter declared that he was willing to forget everything that he loved the genius and admired the erudition of dr eck and that the proceedings of his old friend had caused him more grief than anger i am ready says he either for peace or war but i prefer peace do you then set about it grieve with us that the devil has thrown among us this beginning of strife and then rejoice that christ in his mercy hath removed it about the same time he addressed a most friendly letter to eck who however not only did not answer it but did not even send him a verbal message it was too late for reconciliation and the breach became wider and wider the pride of eck and his unforgiving temper soon completely broke any remaining ties of friendship end of book three chapter nine book three chapter ten of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten popular writings our father thy kingdom come thy will be done our daily bread sermon on repentance forgiveness through christ such were the struggles which the champion of the word of god had to maintain at the outset of his career but these combats with the leaders of society these academical disputes are of small account with the christian human doctors imagine they have gained the noblest of triumphs if they succeed in filling some newspapers and some saloons with the noise of their systems as it is with them more an affair of self-love or party spirit than of good to humanity this worldly success satisfies them accordingly their labours are only a smoke which after blinding us passes off and leaves no trace behind 
neglecting to introduce their fire among the masses of the population they do nothing more than make it skim along the surface of society it is not so with the christian his object is not success in a coterie or an academy but the salvation of souls he therefore willingly avoids the brilliant skirmishing which he might carry on at his ease with the champions of the world and prefers the obscure labours which carry life and light into rural cottages and the lanes of cities thus did luther or rather according to the precept of his master he did the one without leaving the other undone while combating inquisitors university chancellors and masters of the sacred palace he strove to diffuse sound religious knowledge among the multitude with that view he at this time published different popular writings such as his discourses on the ten commandments delivered two years before in the church of wittemberg and which we have already noticed and his exposition of the lord's prayer for simple and ignorant laymen who would not like to know how the reformer then addressed the people we will quote some of the words which he sent as he says in the preface to the second of these works to course the country prayer that inward act of the heart will doubtless ever be one of the points with which a reformation in heart and life must commence and accordingly it early engaged the attention of luther it is impossible in a translation to keep up his energetic style and the vigour of a language which was formed so to speak as it fell from his pen however we will try when you pray says he have few words but many thoughts and affections and above all let these be profound the less you speak the better you pray few words and many thoughts make the christian many words and few thoughts the pagan seeming and bodily prayer is that muttering of the lips that external babble which comes forth without attention striking the eyes and ears of men but prayer in spirit and in truth is the inward desire the emotions and sighs which proceed from the depths of the heart the former is the prayer of hypocrites and of all who trust in themselves the latter is the prayer of the children of god who walk in his fear then coming to the first words of our lord's prayer our father he thus expresses himself among all the names of god there is none which inclines more toward him than the name of father we should not have so much happiness and consolation in calling him lord or god or judge by this name of father his bowels of compassion are moved for there is no voice more lovely or touching than that of a child to its father who art in heaven he who confesses that he has a father in heaven owns himself to be as it were an orphan on the earth hence his heart feels an ardent desire like that of a child living out of its father's country among strangers in wretchedness and sorrow it is as if he said alas my father thou art in heaven and i thy miserable child am on the earth far from thee in all sorts of dangers necessities and sorrows hallowed be thy name he who is passionate and envious who curses or slanders dishonours god in whose name he was baptized applying the vessel which god has consecrated to profane uses he resembles a priest who should use the holy cup to give drink to a sow or to gather manure thy kingdom come those who amass wealth who erect magnificent buildings who seek after all that the world can give and with the lips repeat this prayer are like the large pipes of a church organ which sounds and cries at full pitch and without ceasing but has neither words nor sense nor reason farther on luther attacks the error of pilgrimages which was then so general one goes to rome another to st james one builds a chapel another founds an endowment in order to reach the kingdom of god but all neglect the essential point which is to become themselves his kingdom why do you go beyond seas in quest of the kingdom of god 
your heart is the place in which it ought to rise it is a dreadful thing continues he to hear us utter this prayer thy will be done where in the church do we see this will done bishop rises against bishop and church against church priests monks and nuns quarrel and fight throughout there is nothing but discord and yet all parties exclaim that they have a good will and an upright intention and so to the honour and glory of god they altogether do the work of the devil why do we say our bread continues he explaining these words give us this day our daily bread because we pray not for the ordinary bread which pagans eat and which god gives to all men but for our bread bread to us children of the heavenly father and what then is this bread of god it is jesus christ our lord i am the living bread which came down from heaven and give life to the world wherefore let us not deceive ourselves sermons and instructions which do not represent to us or give us the knowledge of jesus christ cannot be the daily bread and food of our souls what avails it that such a bread is prepared for us if it is not served out to us and we cannot taste it it is as if a magnificent feast were prepared and there were nobody to hand the bread bring the dishes and pour out the liquor so that the guests would be left to feed by the eye and the smell this is the reason why it is necessary to preach christ and christ alone but what then you ask is it to know jesus christ and what profit is gained by it answer to learn to know jesus christ is to comprehend what the apostle says christ has of god been made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption now you comprehend this when you perceive that your wisdom is culpable folly your righteousness damnable iniquity your holiness damnable pollution your redemption miserable condemnation when you feel that before god and all the creatures you are truly a fool a sinner an impure and condemned man and when you show not only by your words but from the bottom of your heart and by your works that there remains to you no comfort and no salvation save jesus christ to believe is nothing else than to eat this bread of heaven thus luther faithfully fulfilled his resolution to open the eyes of a people whom priests had blindfolded and were leading at their pleasure his writings which in a short time spread over all germany caused new light to arise and shed the seeds of truth in abundance on a soil well prepared to receive it but while thinking of those at a distance he did not forget those who were near the dominicans from their pulpits denounced him as an infamous heretic luther the man of the people and who had he been so disposed could with a few sentences have set them in commotion always disdained such triumphs and made it his sole aim to instruct his hearers his reputation which was continually extending and the courage with which he raised the banner of christ in the midst of an enslaved church made his sermons to be followed with increasing interest never had the confluence been so great luther went straight to the point one day having mounted the pulpit of wittemberg he undertook to establish the doctrine of repentance the discourse pronounced on this occasion afterwards became very celebrated and contained several of the fundamental principles of evangelical doctrine at first he contrasts the pardon of men with the pardon of heaven there are says he two remissions the remission of the penalty and the remission of the fault the former reconciles man externally with the church the latter which is the heavenly indulgence reconciles man with god if a man has not within himself that tranquil conscience that cheerful heart which god's remission gives no indulgence can aid him were he to buy all that ever had been on the earth he afterwards continues thus they wish to do good works before their sins are pardoned whereas sins must be pardoned before good works can be done works do not banish sin 
but banish sin and you will have works good works should be done with a cheerful heart and a good conscience toward god in other words with the forgiveness of sins he then comes to the principal object of his sermon an object which was identified with that of the whole reformation the church had put herself in the place of god and his word he objects to this and makes everything depend on faith in the word the remission of the fault says he is not in the power of the pope or the bishop or the priest or any man whatever but rests solely on the word of christ and your own faith for christ did not choose to build our comfort or our salvation on a word or work of man but only on himself on his own work and word your repentance and your works may deceive you but christ your god will never deceive will never waver and the devil cannot overthrow his words a pope or a bishop has no more power than the humblest priest where the remission of the fault is in question and even where there is no priest each christian were it a woman or a child can do the same thing for if a simple christian says to you god pardons sin in the name of jesus christ and you receive the saying with firm faith as if god himself had spoken you are acquitted if you believe not that your sins are pardoned you make your god a liar and declare that you put greater confidence in your vain thoughts than in god and his word under the old testament neither priest nor king nor prophet had power to proclaim the forgiveness of sins but under the new testament every believer has this power the church is quite replete with the remission of sins if a pious christian comforts your conscience by the word of the cross be it man or woman young or old receive the comfort with a faith so firm that you would sooner submit to many deaths than doubt that it is ratified in the presence of god repent and do all the works that you can do but let the faith which you have in the pardon of jesus christ stand in the front rank and have sole command on the field of battle thus spoke luther to his astonished and enraptured hearers all the scaffoldings which impudent priests had for their own profit reared between god and the soul of man were thrown down and man brought face to face with his maker the word of pardon came down pure from on high without passing through a thousand corrupting channels it was no longer necessary that the testimony of god in order to be available should previously be stamped by men with their false seal the monopoly of the sacerdotal caste was abolished and the church emancipated end of book three chapter ten book three chapter eleven of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven apprehensions of luther's friends journey to heidelberg bibra the palatinate castle the paradoxes Busa, brentz snepf the old professor meanwhile the fire which had been kindled at wittemberg behoved to be kindled elsewhere luther not contented with announcing the truth in the place of his residence whether to the academic youth or to the people was desirous to shed the seeds of sound doctrine in other places the augustin order were to hold their general chapter at heidelberg in the spring of fifteen eighteen luther as one of the most distinguished men of the order was invited to attend but his friends did all they could to dissuade him from undertaking the journey in fact the monks had laboured to render the name of luther odious in all the places through which he had to pass to insult they had added threatening and a small matter might have sufficed to excite a popular tumult of which he might have been made the victim or even said his friends what they may not dare to do by violence they will accomplish by fraud and stratagem but in the discharge of a duty luther did not allow himself to be arrested by the fear of any danger however imminent 
he therefore turned a deaf ear to the timid suggestions of his friends and directed them to him in whom his confidence was placed and under whose protection he desired to undertake the perilous journey after the feast of easter he quietly set out on foot on the thirteenth of april fifteen hundred and eighteen he had with him a guide named urban who carried his small bundle and was to accompany him as far as würzburg how many thoughts must have occupied the heart of the servant of the lord during this journey at weissenfels the pastor though not of his acquaintance instantly recognized him as the doctor of wittemberg and gave him a hearty reception at erfurt he was joined by two other augustin friars at judenbach the three fell in with degenard pfeffinger the elector's confidential counsellor who entertained them at the inn i have had the pleasure wrote luther to spalatin of making this rich lord some shillings poorer you know how i like to take every occasion of making a hole in the purses of the rich for the benefit of the poor especially if the rich are my friends he arrived at coburg worn out with fatigue all goes well by the grace of god wrote he only i confess i have sinned in undertaking the journey on foot but for this sin i presume i will have no need of the remission of indulgences for my contrition is perfect and my satisfaction complete i am knocked up with fatigue and all the conveyances are full is not this enough or rather more than enough of penitence contrition and satisfaction the reformer of germany not finding a place in the public conveyances nor any one who was willing to yield him his place was obliged next morning notwithstanding of his fatigue humbly to resume his journey on foot he arrived at Würzburg on the evening of the second sabbath after easter and sent back his guide bishop bibra who had received the thesis with so much delight lived in this town and luther had a letter for him from the elector of saxony the bishop overjoyed at the opportunity of becoming personally acquainted with this bold champion of the truth hastened to invite him to the episcopal palace he went out to receive him spoke to him in the kindest terms and offered to furnish him with a guide as far as heidelberg but at Würzburg, luther had fallen in with his two friends the vicar-general staupitz and langer the prior of erfurt who offered him a place in their carriage he therefore thanked bibra for his offer and the next day the three friends set out from Würzburg. they travelled thus for three days conversing together and on the twenty first of april arrived at heidelberg luther went to lodge at the augustin convent the elector of saxony had given him a letter to count palatine wolfgang duke of bavaria luther repaired to his magnificent castle the sight of which is still the admiration of strangers the monk of the plains of saxony had a heart to admire the position of heidelberg where the two lovely valleys of the rhine and the necker unite he delivered his letter to james simler steward of the court simler having read it said truly you have here a valuable letter of credit the count palatine received him with much kindness and often invited him as well as langer and staupitz to his table this friendly reception added greatly to luther's comfort we relax and amuse ourselves with an agreeable and pleasant chit-chat says he eating and drinking and surveying all the magnificence of the palatine palace admiring its ornaments its armory and cuirasses in short everything remarkable in this distinguished and truly royal castle however luther had other work to do he behoved to work while it was day transported to a university which exercised great influence on the west and south of germany he was there to strike a blow which should shake the churches of those countries such discussions were of ordinary occurrence but luther felt that in order to make his useful it was necessary to give it a particular interest his disposition moreover inclined him to present the truth under a paradoxical form the professors of the university would not allow the discussion to take place in their public hall 
and it became necessary to hold it in a hall of the Augustine convent. The 26th of April was the day on which it was to take place. Heidelberg, at a later period, received the gospel, and even at this discussion in the convent, an observer might have augured that good would result from it. The reputation of Luther attracted a large concourse of hearers. Professors, courtiers, citizens, and students crowded to it. The doctor gave the name of paradoxes to his theses, and it is perhaps the name which might still be applied to them in the present day. It would be easy, however, to translate them into evident propositions. The following are some of the paradoxes. Number 1. The law of God is a salutary rule of life. Nevertheless, it cannot aid man in his search after righteousness. On the contrary, it impedes him. Number 3. Works of man, however fair and good soever they may be, are to all appearance only mortal sins. Number 4. Works of God, how deformed and bad soever they may appear, have always an immortal merit. Number 7. The works of the just themselves would be mortal sins, did they not, through holy reverence for the Lord, fear that their works would in fact be mortal sins. Number 9. To maintain that works done without Christ are dead, but not mortal, is dangerous forgetfulness of the fear of God. Number 13. Since the fall of man, free will exists only in name, and when man does all that is possible for him to do, he sins mortally. Number 16. A man who expects to attain to grace by doing all that it is possible for him to do, adds sin to sin and doubles his guilt. Number 18. It is certain that man, to become capable of receiving the grace of Christ, must entirely despair of himself. Number 21. An honorary theologian calls evil good and good evil, but a theologian of the cross speaks according to truth. Number 22. The wisdom which teaches man to know the invisible perfections of God in his works inflates, blinds, and hardens him. Number 23. The law excites the wrath of God, kills, curses, accuses, judges, and condemns whatever is not in Christ. Still, this wisdom is not bad, and the law is not to be rejected, but the man who does not study the knowledge of God under the cross changes its good into evil. Number 25. He is not justified who does many works, but he who without works believes much in Jesus Christ. Number 26. The law says, do this, and what it commands is never done. Grace says, believe in him, and lo, all things are accomplished. Number 28. The love of God finds nothing in man, but creates in him what it loves. The love of man proceeds from self-love. Five doctors of theology attacked these theses. They had read them with the astonishment which novelty excites. The theology seemed to them very strange. Yet, according to Luther's own testimony, they discussed them with a courtesy which he could not but esteem, and at the same time with force and discernment. Luther, on his part, displayed an admirable mildness in his replies, incomparable patience in listening to the objections of his opponents, and all the liveliness of St. Paul in solving the difficulties which were stated. His answers, which were short, but replete with the word of God, filled all the hearers with admiration. He very much resembles Erasmus, said several, but in one thing he surpasses him. He professes openly what Erasmus is contented only to insinuate. The discussion was drawing to a close. Luther's opponents had retired with honour from the field of battle, the youngest of them, Dr. George Niger, alone continuing the struggle with the mighty combatant. Amazed at the bold propositions of the Augustine monk, and feeling utterly at a loss for argument to refute them, he exclaimed in an agitated tone, Were our peasants to hear such things, they would stone you to death. 
at these words there was a general laugh throughout the audience never had hearers listened more attentively to a theological disputation the first words of the reformer had awakened men's minds and questions which shortly before had met with indifference were now full of interest several countenances gave visible expression to the new ideas which the bold assertions of the saxon doctor had suggested to their minds three youths in particular were strongly moved one of them named martin Bucer, was a dominican of about twenty-seven years of age who notwithstanding of the prejudices of his order seemed unwilling to lose a single word which fell from the doctor born in a little town of alsace he had entered a convent at sixteen and soon displayed such talents that the monks entertained the highest hopes of him he will one day be an ornament to our order said they his superiors had sent him to heidelberg that he might devote himself to the study of philosophy theology greek and hebrew at this period erasmus having published several of his works Bucer read them with avidity shortly after the works of luther appeared and the alsatian student hastened to compare the reformer's doctrine with the holy scriptures some doubt as to the truth of the popish religion arose in his mind this was the way in which light was diffused in those days the elector palatine took notice of the young man his strong and sonorous voice his pleasing address his eloquence and the freedom with which he attacked prevailing vices made him a distinguished preacher he was appointed chaplain to the court and was acting in this capacity when luther's journey to heidelberg was announced Bucer was greatly delighted nobody repaired with greater eagerness to the hall of the augustin convent he had provided himself with paper pens and ink wishing to write down whatever the doctor should say but while his hand was rapidly tracing the words of luther the hand of god was writing the great truths which he heard in more ineffaceable characters on his heart the rays of the doctrine of grace beamed upon his soul on this memorable occasion the dominican was gained over to christ not far from Bucer sat john brentz or brentius then about nineteen years of age brentz who was the son of a magistrate of a town in swabia had at thirteen been enrolled among the students of heidelberg none of them showed such application as soon as the hour of midnight struck brentz rose and commenced his labours this practice became so habitual to him that during the rest of his life he could never sleep beyond that hour at a later period he devoted these still moments to meditation on the scriptures brentz was one of the first to perceive the new light which then rose on germany and he received it into his soul in the full love of it he read the writings of luther with avidity and must have been overjoyed at the prospect of hearing him personally at heidelberg young brentz was particularly struck with one of the doctor's propositions viz not he who does many works is justified before god but he who without works believes much in jesus christ a pious woman of heilbronn on the necker wife of a counsellor of that town named snepf had after the example of hannah dedicated her firstborn to the lord earnestly desiring to see him devote himself to theology the young man who was born in fourteen ninety five made rapid progress in literature but whether from taste or ambition or compliance with his father's wishes he devoted himself to the study of law the pious mother was grieved when she saw her son erhardt following another course than that to which he had dedicated him she warned and urged him and always concluded by reminding him of the vow which she had made at his birth at length overcome by his mother's perseverance erhard snepf yielded and soon felt such delight in his new studies that nothing in the world could have diverted him from them he was in terms of intimacy with Bucer and brentz and they remained friends all their lives for says one of their biographers friendships founded on the love of literature and virtue are never extinguished he was present with his two friends at the heidelberg discussion the paradoxes and the bold struggle of the wittemberg doctor gave snepf a new impulse 
rejecting the vain dogma of human merit he embraced the doctrine of free justification the next day Busser paid a visit to luther i conversed with him says he and without witnesses and had a most exquisite repast not from the viands but from the truths which were set before me whatever objections i stated were readily answered by the doctor who explained everything with the utmost clearness oh that i had time to write yon more about it luther himself was touched with the sentiments of Busser. he is the only friar of his order wrote he to spalatin who is in good faith he is a young man of great promise he received me with simplicity and conversed with me with earnestness he is deserving of our confidence and our love brentz snepf and others also urged by the new truths which began to dawn upon their minds in like manner visited luther speaking and conferring with him and asking explanations of anything which they might not have comprehended the reformer in his answers founded upon the bible at every word that fell from him fresh light arose and his visitors saw a new world opening before them after luther's departure these noble-minded men began to teach at heidelberg it was necessary to follow out what the man of god had begun and not allow the torch which he had kindled to be extinguished the scholars will speak should the masters be silent Brentz, although he was still so youthful, explained St. Matthew, at first in his own room, and afterwards, when it could not contain his hearers, in the hall of philosophy. The theologians, filled with envy at seeing the great concourse which he drew together, were much offended. Brentz next took orders, and transferred his lectures to the College of the Canons of the Holy Spirit in this way the fire which had already been kindled in saxony was kindled also in heidelberg the light radiated from numerous foci this period has been designated the seed time of the palatinate but the fruits of the heidelberg discussion were not confined to the palatinate these bold friends of the truth soon became luminaries in the church they all occupied eminent stations and took part in the numerous discussions to which the reformation gave rise strasburg and at a later period england were indebted to the labours of Busser for a purer knowledge of the truth snepp first taught at marburg and then at stuttgart tubingen and jena Brentz, after teaching at heidelberg long continued to labour at halle in swabia and at tubingen these three individuals will again come before us this discussion caused luther himself to advance he grew daily in the knowledge of the truth i am one of those said he who have made progress by writing and by instructing others and not one of those who from nothing become all at once great and learned doctors he was delighted at seeing the avidity with which youth in schools received the growing truth and this consoled him when he saw how deeply the old doctors were rooted in their opinions i have the glorious hope said he that in like manner as christ when rejected by the jews went to the gentiles we will now see true theology though rejected by these old men of vain and fantastical opinions welcomed by the rising generation the chapter being closed luther thought of returning to wittemberg the count palatine gave him a letter to the elector in which he said that luther had displayed so much ability in the discussion as to reflect great glory on the university of wittemberg he was not permitted to return on foot the augustins of nuremberg conducted him as far as Würzburg, and from thence he proceeded to erfurt with the friars belonging to it as soon as he arrived he called on his old master Jodocus. the venerable professor who had been much concerned and shocked at the career which his pupil had followed was accustomed to put a theta before all luther's sentences that being the letter which the greeks used to express condemnation he had written to the young doctor censuring his conduct and he was anxious to answer by word of mouth not having been received he wrote Jodocus, 
the whole university with the exception of a single licentiate thinks as i do nay more the prince the bishop several other prelates and all our enlightened citizens declare with one voice that hitherto they have neither known nor understood jesus christ and his gospel i am ready to receive your correction and though it should be harsh i will think it pleasant unbosom your heart then without fear disburden yourself of your anger i have no wish i am not able to be angry with you god and my conscience bear witness the aged doctor was touched by the sentiments of his old pupil and wished to see if there was no means of removing the condemnatory theta they had an explanation but nothing resulted from it i have at least said luther made him understand that all their sentences are like the beast which is said to eat itself but it is vain to speak to the deaf the doctors cling obstinately to their petty distinctions although they confess that they have nothing to support them but what they term the light of natural reason a dark chaos to us who proclaim no other light than jesus christ the only true light luther quitted erfurt in the carriage of the convent he was thus brought to eisleben and from thence the augustines of the place proud of a doctor who threw so much lustre on their order and on their town which had given him birth caused him to be conveyed to wittemberg with their own horses and at their own expense all were desirous to testify affection and esteem for the extraordinary man who was rising at every step he arrived on saturday after the ascension the journey had done him good his friends found him stronger and healthier looking than before his departure and were delighted with all he told them luther reposed for some time from the fatigues of his campaign and the discussion at heidelberg but this repose was only a preparation for more severe exertions end of book three chapter eleven book four of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by christopher smith book four luther before the legate may to december fifteen hundred and eighteen chapter one repentance the pope leo the tenth luther to his bishop luther to the pope luther to the vicar-general rovere to the elector discourse on excommunication influence and power of luther truth had at length raised her head in the bosom of christendom victorious over the inferior organs of the papacy she behoved to have a struggle with its chief we are going to see luther at close quarters with rome this step was taken on his return from heidelberg his first theses on indulgences had been misunderstood and he determined to explain their meaning with greater clearness the outcry raised by the blind hatred of his enemies had convinced him how important it was to gain the most enlightened part of the nation in favour of truth and he resolved to appeal to its judgment by calling attention to the foundation on which his convictions rested it was indeed necessary for once to appeal to the decision of rome and he hesitates not to send all his explanations presenting them with one hand to the enlightened and impartial among his countrymen he with the other lays them before the throne of the sovereign pontiff these explanations of his theses which he denominated solutions were written with great moderation luther tried to soften the passages which had caused most irritation and gave proof of genuine modesty at the same time he showed that his convictions were immovable and he courageously defended all the propositions which truth obliged him to maintain he again repeated that every christian who truly repents possesses the remission of sins without indulgence that the pope like the humblest of priests can only simply declare what god has already pardoned 
that the treasure of the merits of the saints administered by the pope was a chimera and that the holy scripture was the only rule of faith let us hear himself on some of these points he begins with establishing the nature of true penitence and contrasts the divine act which renews man with the mummery of the romish church the greek word metanoite says he signifies be clothed with a new spirit and new feelings have a new nature so that ceasing to be earthly you may become heavenly christ is a teacher of the spirit and not of the letter and his words are spirit and life he therefore inculcates not those external penances which the proudest sinners can perform without being humbled but a repentance according to spirit and truth a repentance which may be fulfilled in all the situations of life under the purple of kings the cassock of priests and the coronet of princes amid the magnificence of babylon where a daniel lived as well as under a monk's frock and a beggar's tatters farther on we meet with these bold words i give myself no trouble as to what pleases or displeases the pope he is a man like other men there have been several popes who loved not only errors and vices but even the things still more extraordinary i listen to the pope as pope that is when he speaks in the canons according to the canons or when he decides some article with a council but not when he speaks out of his own head if i did otherwise would i not be bound to say with those who know not jesus christ that the horrible massacres of christians of which julius the second was guilty were the kind acts of an affectionate shepherd towards the lord's sheep i cannot but be astonished continues he at the simplicity of those who have said that the two swords of the gospel represent the one the spiritual power and the other the temporal yes the pope holds a sword of steel and so exhibits himself to christendom not as a tender father but as a formidable tyrant ah god in his anger has given us the sword we wished and withdrawn that which we despised in no quarter of the world have there been more dreadful wars than among christians why did the ingenious intellect which discovered this fine commentary not with equal subtlety interpret the history of the two keys committed to st peter and in that way make it an established dogma of the church that the one serves to open the treasures of heaven and the other the treasures of the world it is impossible he again says that a man can be a christian without having christ and if he has christ he at the same time has all that belongs to christ the thing which gives peace to our conscience is that by faith our sins are no longer ours but christ's on whom god has laid them and that on the other hand all the righteousness of christ is ours to whom god has given it christ puts his hand upon us and we are cured he throws his mantle over us and we are covered for he is the glorious saviour blessed for ever and ever with such views of the riches of salvation by jesus christ there was no need of indulgences luther while attacking the papacy speaks honourably of leo x the times in which we live are so bad says he that even the greatest personages cannot come to the help of the church we have now a very good pope in leo x his sincerity and knowledge fill us with joy but what can one man though amiable and agreeable do by himself alone he certainly deserved to be pope in better times we in our day deserve only such popes as julius the second and alexander the sixth he afterwards comes to the crowning point i wish to say the thing in a few words and boldly the church stands in need of a reformation and this cannot be the work either of a single man like the pope or of many men like the cardinals and fathers of councils but it must be that of the whole world or rather it is a work which belongs to god only as to the time in which such a reformation ought to begin he alone who created time can tell 
the embankment is broken down and it is no longer in our power to arrest the torrents which are rushing impetuously along such are some of the thoughts and declarations which luther addressed to the enlightened among his countrymen the feast of pentecost was at hand and at this period when the apostles rendered the first testimony of their faith to the risen saviour luther a new apostle published this enlivening book in which he expressed his earnest longings for a resurrection of the church saturday the twenty second of may fifteen eighteen being pentecost eve he sent his work to his ordinary the bishop of brandenburg with the following letter most worthy father in god some time ago when a novel and unheard-of doctrine touching the apostolic indulgences began to make a noise in these countries both learned and ignorant felt concerned and many persons some of them known to me and others whom i did not even know by face urged me to publish by word of mouth or by writing what i thought of the novelty i am unwilling to say the impudence of this doctrine at first i was silent and kept back but at length matters came to such a point that the holiness of the pope was compromised what was i to do i thought it best neither to approve nor to condemn these doctrines but to establish a discussion on this important point until the holy church should decide nobody having come forward to this combat to which i had invited all the world and my theses having been considered not as materials for discussion but positive assertions i feel myself obliged to publish an explanation of them deign then most gracious bishop to receive these trifles at my hand and that all the world may see i am not acting presumptuously i supplicate your reverence to take pen and ink and blot out or even throw into the fire and burn whatever in them displeases you i know that jesus christ has no need of my labours and my services and that he can very well without me publish good tidings to his church not that the bulls and menaces of my enemies deter me very much the contrary if they were not so impudent and so shameless nobody would hear a word from me i would shut myself up in a corner and there study by myself for myself if this affair is not of god it certainly cannot be my affair nor that of any man but a thing of naught let the glory and honour be ascribed to him to whom alone they belong luther had still the greatest respect for the head of the church he supposed that there was justice in leo x and a sincere love of truth he resolved therefore to apply to him also and eight days after on trinity sunday thirtieth of may fifteen hundred and eighteen addressed him in a letter of which we give the following extracts to the most blessed father leo x sovereign bishop friar martin luther augustine wishes eternal salvation i learn most holy father that evil reports are current with regard to me and that my name is brought into bad odour with your holiness i am called heretic apostate traitor and a thousand other opprobrious epithets what i see astonishes what i hear amazes me but the only foundation of my tranquillity remains and that is a pure and peaceful conscience be pleased to listen to me most holy father to me who am only an ignorant child luther relates the origin of the whole affair and continues thus in all taverns nothing was heard but complaints of the avarice of priests and attacks on the power of the keys and the sovereign pontiff this all germany can testify on hearing these things my zeal for the glory of christ was moved so i thought or if they will explain it otherwise my young and boiling blood was inflamed i warned several of the princes of the church but some mocked me and others turned a deaf ear all seemed paralyzed by the terror of your name then i published the discussion and this most holy father this is the fire which is said to have set the whole world in flames now what must i do i cannot retract and i see that this publication is subjecting me to inconceivable hatred in all quarters 
I love not to stand forth in the midst of the world, for I am without knowledge, without talent, and far too feeble for such great things, especially in this illustrious age, in which Cicero himself, were he alive, would be obliged to hide in some obscure corner. But in order to appease my adversaries, and respond to numerous solicitations, I here publish my thoughts. I publish them, Holy Father, that I may place myself in safety under the shadow of your wings. All who are willing will thus be able to understand with what simplicity of heart I have asked the ecclesiastical authority to instruct me, and what respect I have shown for the power of the keys. If I had not managed the affair in a becoming manner, it is impossible that the most serene lord, Frederick, Duke and Elector of Saxony, who shines among the friends of apostolical and Christian truth, would ever have tolerated in his university of Wittenberg a man so dangerous as I am represented to be. Wherefore, most holy father, I throw myself at the feet of your holiness, and submit to you with all I have and all I am. Destroy my cause, or embrace it. Decide for me, or decide against me. Take my life, or restore it to me, just as you please. I will recognize your voice as the voice of Jesus Christ, who presides and speaks by you. If I have deserved death, I refuse not to die. The earth belongs unto the Lord and all that it contains. Let him be praised to all eternity. Amen. May he sustain you for ever and ever. Amen. On the third day of the Holy Trinity, in the year 1518, Friar Martin Luther Augustine what humility and truth in this fear, or rather in this confession of Luther, that this young and boiling blood had perhaps been too quickly inflamed. We here recognize the man of sincerity, who, not presuming on himself, fears the influence of passion even in those of his actions which are most conformable to the word of God. There is a wide difference between this language and that of a proud fanatic we see in luther an earnest desire to gain over leo to the cause of truth to prevent all disruption and make this reformation the necessity of which he proclaims come from the very pinnacle of the church assuredly he is not the person who ought to be charged with destroying in the west that unity the loss of which was afterwards so much regretted he sacrificed everything in order to maintain it everything but truth it was not he, but his adversaries, who, by refusing to acknowledge the fullness and sufficiency of the salvation wrought out by Jesus Christ, are chargeable with having rent the Saviour's robe at the foot of the cross. After writing this letter, Luther, the very same day, addressed his friend Staupitz, vicar-general of his order. It was through him he wished his solutions and his epistle to reach Leo. I pray you, says he to him, kindly to accept the miserable things which I send you, and transmit them to the excellent Pope Leo X. Not that I would hereby drag you into the perils to which I am exposed. I wish to take all the danger to myself. Jesus Christ will see whether what I have said comes from him or comes from me. Jesus Christ, without whose will neither the tongue of the Pope can move, nor the hearts of kings resolve. To those who threaten me I have no answer to give, unless it be the remark of Reuchlin, the poor man has nothing to fear, for he has nothing to lose. I have neither money nor goods, and I ask none. If I once possessed some honour and some reputation, let him that has begun to strip me of them finish his work. I have nothing left but this miserable body, enfeebled by so many trials. Let them kill it by force or fraud to the glory of God. In this way they will perhaps shorten my life an hour or two. Enough for me to have a precious Redeemer, a powerful priest, Jesus Christ the Lord, I will praise him while I have a breath of life, and if none will praise him with me, how can I help it? These words enable us to read Luther's heart. 
while he was thus looking with confidence towards rome rome had thoughts of vengeance towards him on the third of april cardinal raphael de rovere had written to the elector frederick in the pope's name stating that suspicions were entertained of his faith and that he ought to beware of protecting luther cardinal raphael says luther would have had great pleasure in seeing me burned by duke frederick thus rome began to wet her arms against luther and the first blow which she aimed at him was through the mind of his protector if she succeeded in destroying the shelter under which the monk of wittemberg was reposing he would become an easy prey the german princes attached much importance to their reputation as christian princes the slightest suspicion of heresy filled them with alarm and the court of rome had shrewdly availed itself of this feeling frederick moreover had always been attached to the religion of his fathers and raphael's letter made a very strong impression on his mind but it was a principle with the elector not to act hastily in anything he knew that truth was not always on the side of the strongest the transactions of the empire with rome had taught him to distrust the selfish views of that court and he was aware that in order to be a christian prince it was not necessary to be the pope's slave he was not says melancthon one of those profane spirits who wish to stifle all changes in their first beginnings frederick resigned himself to god he carefully read the writings which were published and what he judged true he allowed no one to destroy he had power to do so supreme in his own states he was respected in the empire at least as highly as the emperor himself it is probable that luther learned something of this letter of cardinal raphael which was sent to the elector on the seventh of july perhaps it was the prospect of excommunication which this roman missive seemed to presage that led him to mount the pulpit of wittemberg on the fifteenth of the same month and on this subject deliver a discourse which made a profound impression he distinguished between internal and external excommunication the former excluding from communion with god and the latter excluding only from the ceremonies of the church nobody says he can reconcile a lapsed soul with god save god himself nobody can separate man from communion with god unless it be man himself by his own sins happy he who dies unjustly excommunicated while for righteousness sake he endures a heavy infliction on the part of man he receives the crown of eternal felicity from the hand of god some highly applauded this bold language while others were more irritated by it but luther was no longer alone and although his faith needed no other support than that of god a phalanx of defence against his enemies was formed around him the germans had heard the voice of the reformer his discourses and his writings sent forth flashes which awoke and illumined his contemporaries the energy of his faith fell in torrents of fire on slumbering hearts the life which god had infused into this extraordinary soul was imparted to the dead body of the church and christendom which had for so many ages been motionless was animated with a religious enthusiasm the devotedness of the people to the superstitions of rome diminished every day and the number of hands which offered money for the purchase of pardon became fewer and fewer while at the same time luther's fame continued to increase people turned towards him and hailed him with love and respect as the intrepid defender of truth and liberty no doubt the full depth of the doctrines which he announced was not perceived it was enough for the greater number to know that the new doctor withstood the pope and that the empire of priests and monks was shaken by his powerful word to them the attack of luther was like one of those fires which are kindled on mountain tops as the signal for a whole nation to rise and burst its chains before the reformer suspected what he had done all the generous-hearted among his countrymen had already acknowledged him for their leader to many however the appearance of luther was something more the word of god which he wielded with so much power pierced their minds like a sharp two-edged sword 
and their hearts were inflamed with an ardent desire to obtain the assurance of pardon and eternal life since primitive times the church had not known such hungering and thirsting after righteousness if the preaching of peter the hermit and bernard so aroused the population of the middle ages as to make them take up a perishable cross the preaching of luther disposed those of his time to embrace the true cross the truth which saves the framework which then lay with all its weight on the church had smothered everything the form had destroyed the life but the powerful word given to luther caused a quickening breath to circulate over the soil of christendom at the first glance the writings of luther were equally captivating to believers and unbelievers to unbelievers because the positive doctrines afterwards to be established were not yet fully developed in them and to believers because they contained the germ of that living faith which they so powerfully express hence the influence of these writings was immense they spread almost instantaneously over germany and the world the prevailing impression of men everywhere was that they were assisting not at the establishment of a sect but at the new birth of the church and of society those who were born of the spirit of god ranged themselves around him who was its organ christendom was divided into two camps the one leagued with the spirit against the form and the other with the form against the spirit it is true that on the side of the form were all the appearances of strength and grandeur and on the side of the spirit those of feebleness and insignificance but the form devoid of the spirit is a lifeless body which the first breath may upset its appearance of power only